Good afternoon and welcome to the Saturday Scholars. Uh, this is our fourth Saturday Scholars of the season and we are uh, at the we are now in Saturday Scholars. Um, so today uh, is, I'm going to introduce in a moment Jessica Payne, but let me just remind you uh, of the last two Saturday Scholars to come, and I hope still to be 6-0 by the end of the season. Uh, next, uh, the next home game will be on the 3rd of November, and that's against uh, Pitt, and that will be Brad Gregory, uh, whose talk is called The Unintended Reformation, How a Religious Revolution Secularized Society. Uh, it's the subject of his recent book that has garnered prize after prize after prize. And the final uh, home game against Wake Forest on the 17th of November, Mark Roach will be asking, what's so funny about a joke? Today's uh, Saturday Scholars is by Jessica Payne, and Jessica is uh, Assistant Professor and Nancy O'Neill Collegiate Chair in Psychology and Director of the Sleep, Stress and Memory Lab, uh, its acronym is SAM, uh, stress and sleep, stress and memory, the SAM lab. Um, in a recent article on, on the homepage uh, about her work, it said, nodding off in class may not be such a bad idea after all. New research that Professor Payne has been doing shows that going to sleep shortly after learning new material is most beneficial for recall, which convincingly proves that all my students must have been having a really good class before mine. <laughs> Her work has been on how sleep and stress independently and interactively influence human memory, emotion, performance, and creativity. And she teaches courses in psychology and neurobiology, including a very popular course entitled The Sleeping Brain, for which she won uh, Harvard University's Box Center Award for Teaching Excellence, and also the Notre Dame Frank O'Malley Award for Undergraduate Teaching and Service. Yet another award recently won is the Laid Cermak Award for her contribution to memory research. And she's recently become interested in applying her research findings to business organizations, trying to understand and help leaders to understand how to work with rather than against the natural abilities of the human brain. And for that reason, she's currently the H. Smith Richardson Jr. Fellow at the Center for Creative Leadership in Greensboro, North Carolina. But thank goodness she spends most of her time here and not in Greensboro. Please welcome Professor Jessica Payne. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So are these on? Everything, everybody can hear me? Yes? Okay, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here. I'm excited to talk to you today about sleep. But I'm actually going to begin, I think, with a, a rather embarrassing admission. And that is that here I am in the year 2012 as a sleep neuroscientist, and I need to admit somewhat sheepishly to you that we as scientists don't yet know why we sleep. That is to say, we don't know sleep's function. Now, if you think about this for a second, it's absolutely preposterous that we don't understand this yet, because this is something that most of us spend a third of our lives doing. You can imagine an alien from another planet coming down and watching these busy, productive human beings that suddenly, for no apparent reason, lay down, stop functioning, and then get back up again. And that would be strange. And to me, it is very strange. And I've devoted my career thus far to trying to understand why we do it. And yet, there's no answer yet. And yet, what's interesting is that every animal studied in the lab to date sleeps, some of us in more comfortable positions than others. But why? Why do we sleep? There are many different theories about this. And there is a lot of support for these theories. So we know that sleep is essential for fundamental biological function, including your ability to rejuvenate your cells and your tissues if you're injured, to regulate your immune system, and to help you regulate body temperature as well. And there's evidence for all of this. But as far as understanding what the true function of sleep is or why sleep evolved, the best evidence to date is actually that sleep evolved for and by the brain, and for all of the cognitive faculties that the brain supports, like memory, cognition, emotion regulation, creativity. And so what I'm going to try to do today is to convince you 
that sleep is tremendously important for our cognitive abilities. So in terms of memory, not just for forming new memories and committing them permanently to the mind so that you can remember things later on, which for some of us, including myself, is getting harder and harder, but even more importantly, so that you can take what you know, take those memories, and recombine them in novel ways that allow you to engage in acts of what I like to call creative cognition. So to allow you to have insight into problems, to allow you to draw inferences that you might otherwise not see. And I'm going to show you evidence that this happens preferentially and sometimes only after a period of sleep and not after a period of wake. So given how dark the room is, I also want you to know that if I see any of you nodding off, I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> I might be the only professor on this campus that feels you know, deeply touched when my students fall asleep because I just know that that means that they're really trying to commit to memory and consolidate what I'm teaching them. Okay? So no offense will be taken if you nod off for a little while. And I should also mention that really if I have a goal today, I am hoping that after seeing the data that I'm about to present to you, that you'll want to sleep more, that you'll take it a little bit more seriously, that you won't feel lazy and guilty if you nap, and that you'll really see it as this, this really elegant and beautiful thing that we do that's been conserved both across evolutionary time and across species because it serves so many critical functions and purposes for the brain and the mind and for the cognitive faculties that the brain and mind support. Okay, so let's begin with some basics of sleep. The first thing to sleep is to know that the physiology and the chemistry of the brain change just dramatically across the night. And I'm going to say, show you a series of slides now that the aim of which is to convince you that sleep is really not an inert state, and it's not a unitary state. So let's get started by looking at what a good night of sleep really looks like. And I should tell you that this really is a good night of sleep in an adolescent. Sleep does change with age, although not in the dramatic ways you might think. We should all still be aiming for this, even as we age into our 70s and our 80s and beyond. And there's evidence that if we can preserve this type of sleep into our older years, that we're going to age much more gracefully, both in terms of our physical health and in terms of our cognitive health. So this is what you call sleep architecture or a sleep histogram. And the way it works is that you should actually spend very little time actually falling asleep. And you should very quickly dive down into stages three and four sleep, which are collectively known as slow wave sleep. Now, most of you know what this type of sleep is like because this is the stage of sleep that's so deep that if you get awakened out of it, you hardly know who you are where you are or what's going on. So that's where if the, your phone rings, you try to answer the doorbell. You, you really are very disoriented. It's such a deep stage of sleep that your brain is really locked in and it's very difficult to wake out of. This is why I think some people have struggles around napping. Because if you actually dive into this stage of sleep, you're going to feel horrible when you wake up. It's better to actually take very, very brief naps so that you don't go into slow wave sleep. You want to spend most of your time in the lighter stages of sleep, which we'll get to here in a moment. The other thing I want you to note here is that the lion's share of your slow wave sleep happens early in the night. And if you juxtapose that with your rapid eye movement sleep where dreaming is so intense, although I should note that dreaming occurs throughout the night, that actually tends to cluster toward the end of sleep. And as we'll see in a second, REM sleep is actually a very light stage of sleep, unlike slow wave sleep, which is so deep. And then there's another stage of sleep to know about called stage two non-REM sleep, quite creatively named, that is relatively evenly distributed throughout the night. And so your brain is cycling through these different stages of sleep throughout the night, and it does so in cycles. We call them ultradian cycles. So here you can see people going down through stages one, two, three, four, back up into REM. This is actually noting wakefulness here, but if it's red, it's a period of REM sleep. So you, you know, going down through stages one, two, three, four, REM, that's an ultradian cycle that takes about 90 minutes. And so again, going back to the benefits of napping, you either want to nap very, very briefly or you want to nap for about 90 minutes so that you can get through one of these whole cycles and get back up into a lighter stage of sleep in order to awaken and feel refreshed and to get the full benefits of the nap. And you can see that the brain does that throughout the night. Okay, so sleep is clearly not a unitary thing. It actually is a collection of vastly different neurobiological states that we think serve completely different functions as far as the brain and cognition. So in fact, the, the point I want to make now is that 
I think there's this bias. In fact, if you go out into the street and you talk to people about what, what sleep is or what it's for, most people will say, well, it's a period of time where the brain sort of switches off and restores itself. But there's this idea that sleep is an inactive state. And if there's one thing I'd like to do today, it's to totally disabuse you of that notion. Because REM sleep in, partic in particular is a highly active state. In fact, when, if I were to bring you into the lab and to have you go to sleep, and I was going to stage your sleep and tell you how much time you spent in stage two REM sleep, slow wave sleep, so on and so forth, I'd attach electrodes to your head. It's very non-invasive. And your brain would start producing very different patterns of electrical activity that we can read out. And the point I want to make here is that wakefulness is a pretty fast, you see a pretty fast sort of rate of neuronal firing that tends to slow down and break up as you get into slow wave sleep. You start to see these spikes, which are called K-complexes, and these really quick bursts, which are called sleep spindles, and that's how we know you're in stage two. Then as you get down into stages three, four, that deep slow wave sleep, you see these big, tall, sort of slow rolling, high amplitude brain waves. But when you get into rapid eye movement sleep, you go back to a very, very fast pattern of activity. And this is actually simplified for educational purposes. But the truth of the matter is that if I'm not looking at the subject sleeping in my lab, it can be almost impossible to differentiate just by looking at the brain waves whether they're awake or they're in rapid eye movement sleep, which is why we can't just use the EEG measuring brain activity when we're staging sleep. We have to use two other things. We have to look at your eyes, and we have to look at your muscle tone. And that's because if you're in rapid eye movement sleep, you'll be producing the, cl the classic rapid eye movements that helped us name that phenomenon. And your muscle tone should be totally flat. Can anybody tell me why your muscles, all your major, major muscle groups, would be pretty much completely paralyzed during rapid eye movement sleep? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Just throw it out at me. I know one of you's got to have it. During rapid eye movement sleep, which remember is when you have your most intense, bizarre, and crazy dreams, why would your muscles be paralyzed? Too much activity. Too much activity. Your brain's focused on your eyes. And you don't want to act out your dreams. The reason you're paralyzed, we've evolved this mechanism, is because otherwise you would literally get up and be chasing lions, or maybe running away from them would be more accurate. You'd be, you know, you, you would actually be living out the dreams. And, and there's, a, a, there's a disorder actually called rapid eye movement behavior disorder where there's something wrong with that paralytic mechanism. And people actually will and do get up and act out their dreams in a way that can be tremendously harmful both to themselves and to others. There are even legal cases where there are murders that take place. And it's like, well, I didn't mean to kill my wife, but I was dreaming about it and therefore did that. <laughs> right? It's actually a brilliant defense. I hate to admit it. And when I get calls, like, do I want to comment? It's like, absolutely not. I don't want to comment about that. <laughs> no way do I want to comment about that. OK? Um, and even the neuromodulation, or the actually ke actual chemicals in your brain, switch from sleep stage to sleep stage. And so just very quickly, when you're actively awake, the major neurotransmitters in your brain that help you process information are actually all pretty high. So uh, there's acetylcholine, which maybe you haven't heard of, but perhaps you've heard of scopolamine or atropine, norepinephrine and serotonin. Maybe you haven't heard of those, but I'll bet most of you have heard of of Prozac and Zoloft, which act on serotonin. And maybe some of you have heard of effects or other antidepressants that actually act on norepinephrine as well. And so these neurotransmitters, which are so important for us during wakefulness, are actually very high if you look at the brain. Well, when you start to drift off and become sort of peaceful and quiet, levels of those chemicals drop. When you get into slow wave sleep, there's literally an undetectable amount of acetylcholine, but lots of those other neurotransmitters and the only point I want to make here is that when you flip into REM, it totally flips. So now you've got a brain that's dominated by acetylcholine, but you have undetectable levels of these other neurotransmitters. And the point that I'm really trying to drive home here, again, is that sleep isn't just this singular thing. It's actually a collection of different neurobiological states. And I don't want anybody to ever tell you that sleep is a state of unconsciousness. It's really not. It's a state, it's a collection of different states of consciousness that can produce very different types of cognitive processing that then allow us to do things like form memories, process and regulate our emotions, and engage in these active acts of creative cognition. So again, really, if there's one take home message for today's talk, it's this, that the sleeping brain, rather than being this inert state when it's switched off, is actually highly, highly active. And not only is it active, but as we're gonna go over right now, 
It's active in the very regions of your brain that are critical for memory, for emotion, for emotion regulation. And so I'm just going to throw some terms at you really quickly um, because they're going to be important in just a few slides. So there's a region of your brain called the hippocampus. In fact, it's right here. If you were to drill a hole into your temple, which I don't recommend, you would, you would hit it. Okay? It's a deep structure. It's an evolutionarily old structure that is critical for your ability to form memories. And we have two. If you damage it bilaterally, there's a famous patient, HM, that some of you may have heard of because he died recently. If you damage that structure bilaterally, you will never be able to form a new memory. Okay? So just as important as the hippocampus and the surrounding cortex is for memory, the amygdala is equally important for emotion. Incidentally, hippocampus sounds like a crazy word. It's Latin for seahorse. Because if you bisect it, it actually kind of looks like the swirly part of a seahorse's tail. And amygdala is Latin for almond. I mean, to me, it does not look like an almond, but whatever. Um, and that is also tremendously active during sleep. And the anterior cingulate part of your medial prefrontal cortex, which is the, the frontal cortex is the most newly evolved part of our brain. Uh, it is a huge, the frontal lobe is absolutely enormous. It's here behind your forehead. And the medial part of that is kind of just behind your eyes. And the reason that this anterior cingulate medial part of your prefrontal cortex is so important is because it's critical for your ability to regulate your emotions. In fact, you can think of it as putting a break on your amygdala. So the amygdala is this ancient structure that allows you to react emotionally, and the anterior cingulate part of your prefrontal cortex helps you keep that in check, right? And, and really, many, so even a lizard has an amygdala, but, but actually very, very few creatures, and mostly primates, have a, a well-developed prefrontal cortex. So these regions in black are actually not just active during REM sleep, they're actually more active than they are during wakefulness. I'm going to say that again, because most people, again, are carrying around this mistaken idea that the sleep is switched off at night. No. These regions that are so important for memory and for emotion and for cognitive processing in general are actually more active during sleep than they are during wakefulness. What's also interesting, though, about REM sleep is there's another region of that frontal lobe higher up called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that's actually deactivated during REM sleep. And this is so interesting because this is actually referred to as the rational control center. This is the part of your brain that tells you what's real and what's not, that tells you that you can't walk through a wall, that you can't fly. It's totally switched off during REM sleep, which is fascinating because what you have now is a brain that's processing all sorts of information, emotional, otherwise, everything you've learned during the day. It's recombining all that information, but, you, but it's sort of not under the control of this rational or executive control center that tells it what it can and can't do. So it produces an amazingly creative state where you can come up with combinations of information and highly novel ideas that you're simply not able to do, neuroscientifically speaking, while you're awake, which is one of the reasons we think sleep can be such a creative state. OK. So the second point I want to make, so the, the first point is that the sleeping brain is highly active. The second point is that everybody sleeps. And when I say everybody, I really do mean everybody, all right? Even singular cellular organisms like these bacteria display the precursor of sleep, which is a marked circadian rhythm. And in fact, there's maybe surprisingly to you an elaborate study of sleep in Drosophilia, our friend the fruit fly that's always buzzing around my wine bottle as a wine advocate, um, an enthusiast. And there are so many interesting studies about these guys where you actually see that the timing of sleep differs between males and females. Maybe some of you won't be surprised to learn that males sleep a lot more than females do as far as these fruit flies. But there's a really interesting genetic analysis of sleep in these um, drosophilia that also tell us a lot about the length of sleep, how much sleep we need. So again, if I can get a brave volunteer, how many hours of sleep do human beings need at night? OK. All right, so there are a lot of different answers out there. But I think I heard a resounding eight. All right? That's another thing. Don't let anybody ever tell you that you need eight hours of sleep. This is something that worries me a lot, because it's in the media over and over and over and over again. Eight hours is an average. And as I like to tell my students, an average doesn't represent anybody. OK? It has nothing to do with the individual case. You're collapsing across that. And yes, on average, people need between um, six and uh, nine hours of sleep. 
I'm, I'm sorry, seven and nine hours of sleep. So the average is eight. So that's true for the overwhelming majority of people, but sleep is normally distributed, meaning it follows the bell curve, right? The normal bell curve, which means that even if you are somebody who sort of luckily, I guess, only needs four hours, or perhaps unfortunately needs 12, you're still normal. It's just statistically unlikely. You're two standard deviations out from the mean. But I like to say this because if you're somebody who knows you need like 10 or 11 hours and you worry that you're lazy, don't. You know, if that's the way you've been all your life, it may just be genetically the amount of sleep you need. They've discovered actually in these fruit flies, short versus long sleeping fruit flies. We know there's a genetic basis to it. Um, you know, my mother is one of these people who really and truly only sleeps four or five hours a night. And she's not somebody who says, I can get by on it. She's somebody who says, that is literally all I need. And I believe it. Not only have I studied her, much to her dismay and, and chronic irritation, because um, she's always got paste in her hair from being in the lab. But I, I mean, she's convinced me that she is somebody who really genuinely only needs about five hours a night. All right? So all of it's normal. It's all normally distributed. All right, so let me transition now and talk about memory. Because as I said at the beginning of the talk, one of the best supported theories to date for a function of sleep, or in other words, why sleep evolved, really is cognitive. And I'm going to focus on memory because there's a huge amount of literature emerging from my lab and other labs suggesting that sleep is absolutely critical for your ability to form new memories and to what we call consolidate them, which means commit them to long-term knowledge. Most of you, when you think about memories, probably think about what you had for last night for dinner or maybe something like uh, long-term episodic memory for your first kiss or learning to drive. But actually, there are different types of memories. And they break down into three general categories. So we call episodic memories um, specific events of your life, so episodes that you can actually retrospectively remember. So for instance, you, most of you should be able to remember what you ate for dinner last night. If not, come, please come talk to me <laughs> after the end of the talk. All right? Um, and then there's general knowledge, though, which really isn't tied to a specific event or episode in your life. So let me just give you some examples here. So most of you probably have either an actual episodic memory for Kennedy's death or for Princess Dies. I've actually had to include this now because people are, my audience are getting younger and younger. Um, and I wasn't even alive for that. So, but most of you probably have a specific episodic memory for one of those events. And some of you can probably even remember where you were, who you were with, what you were doing. You probably have like a pretty crystal clear memory of it because it was such an emotional event for, memory, for many of us. Um, whereas you have general knowledge of Lincoln's assassination. Okay. Most of you, again, probably have a specific memory for the Challenger disaster, but only a general knowledge for the Hindenburg disaster. Again, you should be able to remember what you had last night for dinner, and you should really be able to call it to mind in a vivid way, whereas you have sort of a general knowledge of what your favorite dinners are. And this may or may not be relevant to you. Trust, <laughs> trust me, it's relevant to most of us, all right? And even to me, to, for me today, because man, did I have a hard time parking on this campus. But you have a specific episodic memory for where you park today, let's hope. Otherwise, you might be wandering around for a while. But you, if you work on the Notre Dame campus, you know where you should generally try to find a spot. And that's more of a general memory. Then there's another class of memories that we, ha that we call procedural memories that are sort of how-to memories. So how to do something, how to swing a golf club, how to ride a bike, how to play the piano. And actually, all of these memories rely on different systems in the brain in order for you to be able to remember them well. So I'm going to now show you some evidence that sleep is important, actually, for all of these types of memories. And I'm going to start in that procedural memory domain. So the way we do this in the lab is we have to come up with some kind of a task, right? And we need to have experimental control over it. So rather than actually looking at people learning to play the piano or to golf, which would actually be more interesting in my mind, we come up with these tasks that we have a lot of control over and that we can measure. So this one, we're having people just simply learn a finger tapping sequence task. And they have to do it with their non-dominant hand. And so they might have to learn to tap as fast and as accurately as possible a sequence like 41324. And I don't know how many of you have done data entry, probably never with your non-dominant hand, but that's kind of an awkward sequence to learn. And unsurprisingly, people get better at this with time. So what you're seeing here is that regardless of whether we're training people in the morning or at night, they actually are pretty bad at first. They're only able to tap about you know, probably 14 or so sequences per 30 seconds. But as they train, they get better. 
And then they kind of flatline, or what we call asymptote. They just, their performance just doesn't improve anymore, no matter how much additional training you give them. And what you can see here is there's no circadian difference. It doesn't matter whether we train them in the evening or, the, or at night. They end up in about the same place, which is about 23 or so, 22, 23 sequences per 30 seconds. So this is just showing you that same data, right? It's about 22 or 23 sequences per seconds, uh, uh, sequences per 30 seconds, and it doesn't matter, again, whether we train you in the morning and evening. But now, what if we, instead of giving you additional training, we give you a break, and in that break, we either let you go to sleep or we keep you awake. Well, look at what happens in terms of your improvement in, in performance. In both cases, you get a break. You get an enormous benefit from going to sleep, and you get no additional benefit from staying awake. What's fascinating, though, is in the procedural memory domain, you actually seem to get the benefit from sleep, even if sleep is delayed. So now, if you actually finally let these poor people sleep after they've spent this day awake, even though, the, even though this is a long delay, you still get the same benefit in performance, and this is maintained. So you can't get this jump in your ability to perform this motor task unless you sleep. Now, a lot of athletes and a lot of musicians anecdotally know this, that there's something about sleeping that helps them commit a new piece of music to memory or some type of new um, motor skill to memory. But this is proof of it. OK, so this might be relevant for you golfers and you musicians in the audience, but many of you might be thinking, OK, but what about other types of memory that are more relevant in my day-to-day -day life, my work life, my family life, my desire to recall information from the past, and my desire to learn new information? So there's also an enormous amount of, of evidence that sleep benefits those other classes of memory, too, those episodic and semantic memories, but that it actually goes beyond that to also help us find what's important in this enormous amount of information that we're bombarded with during the day. So first, I'm going to show you evidence that sleep helps us remember the gist, or sort of the, the essence, or the take-home message, if you will. And I could just describe the study to you, but instead, I think I'm going to quickly turn you into participants. All right? So we're going to do a quick memory task. And all I want you to do right now is stare at this little cross on the screen. I'm going to present you with a list of words. And all you need to do is pay attention, because I'm going to test your memory later. Is everybody ready? OK, here we go. OK, now I can't help but thinking that what would be really fun to do if only I had a little more time would be to actually split the room in half and have you guys take a nap. Some of you look like you could actually do it, <laughs> OK? And keep you guys awake in conversation. And then we could compare your performance on your ability to remember that word list, depending on whether you were in the nap group or the wake group. But we don't have time. So instead, we're all going to do the memory task together. So I'm going to present some words here on the screen. And if the word was on the list, you thought you saw the word on the list, I just want you to raise your hand. Please raise it up high so I can see you. And then if the word was not on the list, just keep your hands down. Make sense? OK, here we go. First word. Excellent memories. <laughs> Fabulous. You guys are sharp today, excited for the game. OK, fantastic. Good. So those of you who just raised your hand just actually committed what's called a false memory error. But you know what? That's not what's important about this task. What's important about those of you who raised your hand, you actually are the better performers in this task because you just extracted the gist or the meaning or the essence of this list. This list is about doctors. Think about it. If you went home and told your spouse or significant other or your kids about this task, you wouldn't say like, oh, and then she presented this list of words that consisted of nurse, sick, medicine, health. You would say, and then she put up a list that had everything to do with doctors. In fact, the way these lists are created is we give people words like doctor, and we have them generate the first words that come to mind. OK? So the word doctor really does sort of represent or encapsulate the very gist or essence or meaning of that list. 
And that is adaptive. Think about what would happen if you remembered every single detail in your lives. You'd be glutted. And actually, there's evidence that people who do have extraordinary memory have trouble with sort of higher acts of cognition like inference, generalization, the ability to see patterns. So you really did something adaptive by extracting the gist and sort of letting the details go. So let me just show you what happens in the lab when we bring people in and we have them try to remember these words across periods of sleep or wakefulness. And let me unpack this slide just very quickly. So up here at zero, we always have conditions where we, have, we look at people's performance. We give them eight of these lists, and we see how well they do at recalling these words after just a brief delay. In this case, it's 20 minutes. And in fact, we have them do it at both, in, again, in both the evening and in the morning, because we need to make sure there are no differences in performance based on time of day, and they're not. Okay? So, so what, this, what this zero point represents is this is where you would be at 20 minutes, okay, if I just asked you to recall these words after just a 20-minute delay. And so what you're seeing here as far as the studied words, meaning like you know, the, the words like stethoscope and nurse that really were on that list, you're just seeing massive forgetting. If I gave you a choice, okay, I'm going to have you study a bunch of stuff, and then I'm either going to test you in 20 minutes or in 12 hours, which one would you choose? 20, 20 minutes, yeah, exactly. And that's what you're seeing here is that there's just catastrophic forgetting across the 12-hour period of wakefulness. But what you also see for these studied words is that if you sleep, you actually forget a lot less. And that is another example of what it means for sleep to really benefit your ability to consolidate these memories. But more interestingly is what happens to those gist words like doctor? The, 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 that you adaptively would extract. So what you see here is, again, you get a lot of forgetting from that baseline where you were at 20 minutes if you're awake. But if you're in the sleep group, you actually get better. And it's very, very unusual in memory research to see performance getting better across a 12-hour delay compared to a 20-minute delay. And what that means is that sleep is doing something very, very special for these memories. Now, I want you to pay attention to this pattern, because what this means is that sleep is selectively and preferentially and really only consolidating the gist words, which I believe is what the brain thinks is most important about this task. But we also remember what's emotional when we sleep. So let me tell you about one other task, which is where we give people pictures like this, which just depicts it's a neutral scene, right? There's just an intact car sitting on a background scene, which is a street. And we compare that to memory for an emotional object like a car wreck, but on the same street. So there's always a negative or a neutral object on what's always a neutral background scene. And we have people study a bunch of these scenes at time one. And then after a period of sleep or wake, we bring them back and we have them remember the objects, like the car or the car wreck, and the background separately to see how their memory performance is for those different components of the scenes. And what we see here, again, relative to performance after, in this case, just a 30-minute delay, for those neutral scenes, both the objects, like the car, and the backgrounds, like the street scene, you just have tremendous forgetting, which is interesting in this case because sleep isn't helping you at all. Remember, either component, object, or background of these neutral scenes. It doesn't care a whit about the neutral. But what about the emotional scenes if you sleep or if you stay awake? Well, in this case, what you see Again, it's the same huge amount of forgetting, both for the objects and the backgrounds, in this case, the car wreck and the background scene, across 12 hours of wakefulness. But if we let you go to sleep at night, and by the way, people are sleeping on average for six hours, you find, again, complete memory loss for the backgrounds, but people remembered that emotional object. And again, they remember it better after 12 hours than after a 30-minute delay. That is hugely significant because what it means is that the sleeping brain is not stupid. The sleeping brain is not just slavishly consolidating or committing to memory everything that you put into it during the day. Instead, even at night, even while you're sleeping, the brain is calculating what's important to remember out of your experience of the day and what's okay to forget. So in one case, we see it cares about the gist. In this case, we see it cares about what's emotional. And I would, I would argue that those are two forms of salient information. But what's so fascinating to me is that your brain does this at night while it's asleep. But we also know that sleep helps us go beyond memory consolidation, even this kind of cool selective memory consolidation, to help us see creative connections and put things together differently. Now, the first evidence I ever saw at this in my lab, when I was still at Harvard, actually, was in, going back to that memory test that you guys just participated in. So you were trying to remember words from the doctor list. 
But we give people eight of those lists. So we give them a list about clouds and a list about windows and a list about soft. And what's fascinating about this is that I'd previously worked with this task. And you guys did it as a recognition task where you're just saying yes or no. But usually you can also have people just write down everything they remember. That's a recall task. And that's what I did in the original experiment. And what was so fascinating after having worked with this task for a long time, before I was ever doing sleep research, was that I was suddenly seeing in people's recall these really kind of beautiful, creative, odd, bizarre words that they were remembering with high confidence like cloud and swirl. I'd never seen anything like that before. You know, normally people, they either remember the, the words that were there like nurse, they remember that just word like doctor. Maybe they remember some other word like clinic that's actually not there, but it's clearly associated to that doctor list. You can always kind of tell where the word went. And I was suddenly like, I can't even tell which list these words go to. So, I mean, cloud and swirl, did, did they come from the mountain list? Did they come from the soft list? Did they come from the window list? You can imagine that maybe actually what people are doing while they sleep is they're kind of combining the lists in the meaning of the list. Because you can, can't you kind of imagine like, you know, a cloud sort of, you know, swirling atop a mountain and the cloud is soft and somebody's looking at it outside of the window. It's almost as if these, these lists are being associated. So the question then, and this is all post hoc, by the way, which is not good in science, but I really was wondering, wow, is this type of creative sort of intrusion error more common after you sleep than after you stay awake? And so we had judges come in completely blind to the task and score this information. And sure enough, what we found is that these creative intrusion errors were two and a half times more likely after you slept than they were after wakefulness, which was significant to me at the time because of all this anecdotal evidence out there in the literature that sleep really does inspire insight, creative insight. And you, you probably, the people in this audience who are from other departments like English and music, there are so many examples of sleeping on a problem in the arts. But there are examples in science as well. And so I'm going to give you a couple. The first one is from August Kekulé, who actually discovered the structure of um, benzene out of a visionary dream. Okay. So he's been working on this problem for a long time. He's frustrated. His thoughts aren't progressing. At some point, he turns his chair to the fire and he does. And, he's, and look at that. What did he see? First, these atoms are gambling before his eyes. And then suddenly, he starts dreaming of these snakes. And he says, but look, what was that? Suddenly, one of the snakes has actually curved around and seized hold of its own tail in sort of a circular type fashion. And bang, he wakes up with that insight. He realizes that the structure of benzene follows the same pattern. And a flash of light lightning, he awakes and he spends the rest of the night working out the consequences of his hypothesis. If you think Kekulé is alone, Otto Lovi actually won the Nobel Prize for discovering chemical transmission, again, from a sleep insight. So in his case, same thing. He's working really, really hard on this idea. I always like to say, like, sleep, you know, you, it's not like you can just go to sleep and discover amazing things. You have to put the work in at the forefront, right? You have to do your homework. But again, he's working really hard on this problem. And same thing happens to him, although for him, you know, he, he, turns, he, has a, he wakes up in the middle of the night, he turns on the light, and he jots down a few notes on a slip of paper. He falls asleep again, and the next morning he realizes that it's like gobbledygook. Has anybody done this? I have actually done this where I thought I was brilliant, totally brilliant, and wrote something down that literally made no sense. And I was like, oh my god, I'm actually schizophrenic instead. <laughs> but at least in Livy's case, he does the same thing the following night. And this time at 3 o'clock he wakes up, the idea returned, this time it's clear to him it was the design of an experiment that he uses to determine whether the hypothesis, hypothesis of chemical transmission that he thought of 17 years ago was correct. He gets up, he literally goes to the lab in the middle of the night, he conducts that experiment, and bang, he wins the Nobel Prize. He discovers chemical transmission. And there are so many examples of this in the literature. But as a good scientist, you know, so yeah, I just saw evidence of that kind of creative processing during sleep in that previous experiment with the clouds swirling around in the windows. But that's a post hoc thing. So really, as a scientist, you need to go in and try to design an experiment to prove it, a priori, predicting it first. So we've done that in a couple ways to show that sleep really does help us make these types of connections, these creative connections. And the first one actually is an inference task. And it's so hard and irritating and frustrating to do. So, and I'm not going to make you do it. Don't worry. What I'm going to do, though, is tell you that all we tell our participants is that they're going to see these individual premise pairs, OK? These two together, these two together, these two together, so on and so forth. 
and that all they have to learn is that every time they see these two, and they're nonsense shapes, right? We've actually tried to remove any real world verbal label or anything you could assign to them. So they're like these eggy surfboard shapes, and all we're teaching them is that they have to learn these individual premise pairings. They have to learn the pairings, meaning any time they see A and B together, meaning this greenish one and the blue one, they have to select A over B. Any time they see these two together, they have to select B over C, C over D, D over E, and E over F. And, 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 these are, and they never, incidentally, see the letters, ever. They just see the images. And they never see the whole order that you're seeing here right now. So they're just being presented with one pair at a time. And slowly and frustratingly, through trial and error, they have to learn always to select this one over this one. And it's really hard because they're right, left, reverse. We don't always present them in the same order. But with time, and usually it takes them about an hour, they get up to about 90% proficiency. They learn these premise pairings. Okay, They know which one to select over the other. But what we never tell them, and what some of you may be seeing, because I have it laid out this way with the letters, is that there's an embedded hierarchy in this task. A greater than B, greater than C, greater than D, greater than E, greater than F. Okay, But they don't know that. We never tell them, and they never see. They only see these things one at a time, the pairings one at a time. So then the question becomes, if we bring them back, again, across a period of sleep or a period of wakefulness, and we give them inference pairs that they've never seen before, and just ask them what the best response is, are they going to know to infer that they should select B over D? If they've stitched together this hierarchy in their mind, in that offline delay, they should be able to do it. And, should, and will they also know that they should select C over E? We're calling this a one degree of inference, because they only have to leap over one intervening item in order to get it. Now, the next question is, though, can they make the even more difficult and distant inferential leap across two intervening items and correctly infer that they should select B over E? OK? But we don't tell them anything. All they think is they're learning these individual pairings of these weird shapes. So can they do it? Can they make the inference? Well, if we let them go across just a 20-minute delay for both the one degree and two degree in inference pairs, they're just terrible. They're at chance. They can't do it. So a 20-minute delay isn't enough. In this case, if we let them go across a waking delay of 12 hours, they get better. But look at what happens if we let them sleep. Again, they get preferentially better at that most difficult inferential leap, where they have to leap over the two intervening items in order to get it. And this is actually maintained across 24 hours. So now we have sleep actually allowing you to detect a hidden hierarchy that we never tell you about that allows you to infer things that you've never seen before. Because remember, they'd never seen those inference pairs. They were completely novel to them at test after these different delays. So this was heartening. But we wanted to look at one additional um, type of creative insight. So this is now sort of a mathematical, it's a pretty simple mathematical reasoning task. And here's the rule. I always have a little bit of trouble de describing this. But each, each time, we're going to present them with a sequence of three different numbers. And the rule is, if you're presented with two numbers sequentially, one after the another, then you actually are going to enter that same number. So a 1 and a 1, you'd enter a 1. But there are three numbers here. So any time you're presented with two different numbers, you write down the third. So if I present you with a 1 and a 4, you'd, you'd enter a 9. 4 and a 9, you'd enter a 1. And it's kind of a continuous thing. So and it, and it actually is kind of hard to figure out at first, but then it gets really boring. Because here's the way it works. So the first two numbers you see here right, are a 1 and a 1. So you enter a 1 into the computer. Then, starting with this number, you take this and you take the next one. And because those are two different numbers, you write down a 9. Okay. Now, going from 9 to 4, what would you write down given that those are two different numbers? A 1. OK, so then four, nine and, 1 and 9, 4. 4 and 4, same number, so you write down 4. 4 and 9, different, so you write down 1. 1 and 4, different, so you write down 9. And 9 is your final answer, and that ends that trial. And that's all they're taught to do, is that we want them to get faster and more accurate at this relatively boring task. But what we don't tell them, again, is that embedded in this task is a hidden rule. And if they have insight into that rule, they can speed up their performance and get out of the experiment a lot faster. Because they can enter this final answer at any time. Okay, And that hidden rule is that the last three numbers of this chain are always the mirror image of the three that came before it. So what that means is if they have an insight into that, whether it's conscious or unconscious, then basically, as soon as they get that second answer, 
That's their final answer. They can enter it, and they can get out of the experiment that much faster. But we don't tell them anything. All we tell them is basically how I described to you to do the task in the beginning. So the question is, who has insight into this hidden rule? And it turns out that if we look at people across, you know, in, during the day, before they sleep, some people are just really smart. About 22, 3 percent of them actually get it without sleeping. But look at what happens if we let them sleep. Again, it's about a two and a half fold improvement in performance just by going to sleep. So again and again, we see evidence that these types of creative processing, beginning, the ability to kind of have, in, have insights into things that you don't even know are there. And what's interesting about these tasks is actually people aren't even necessarily fully conscious of it. They just suddenly start doing it faster. Sometimes they can describe it to you, but sometimes not. But in both of these cases, we've basically hidden something from you that your sleeping brain is able to detect and therefore come up with a faster and more efficient way of solving a task. So the final thing I'm going to touch on very briefly today is that we also know that going beyond memory and even creativity, sleep helps our emotions. It not only helps us preserve the emotional things in life that we need to remember, but it helps us regulate our emotions and normalize our mood, which is critical, actually, to, to healthy psychological function. So we know this because we know from the literature that, as I've just shown you, recall of emotional pictures shows much more of a benefit from sleep than your ability to recall neutral pictures. Emotional episodic memory, but not neutral episodic memory, actually correlates with the amount of rapid eye movement sleep you get, which is interesting because you actually tend to have too much rapid eye movement sleep in conditions like depression and anxiety disorders, suggesting that maybe there's an overfocus on the negative emotional. This is fascinating. We know that the content of your REM sleep dreams can actually predict things like when you're going to remit or get better from a depressive episode. So if, there are lots of studies on this. So for instance, if you go through a divorce, your dreams tend to be sort of stereotyped and repetitive, where maybe if your husband left you, you're just focused on how worthless you feel, worthless, worthless, worthless. When your dream content starts to change, so maybe you're standing up to your husband or you're starting to feel more empowered, that actually, those dreams actually predict about two to three weeks later who is going to actually recover from the depression. And after sleep deprivation, we tend to remember only the negative and nothing about the positive things we experience. So I'm just going to quickly show you one last experiment, which is one that I just recently did and recently got published, where, again, we're using that same memory task where you're looking at the negative versus the neutral scenes, like the car wreck on the street versus the intact car on the street. And the only thing that's different about it, they're both times they're either going to be recalling those memories across a period of sleep or across a period of wakefulness, but we're actually having them bring those memories to mind in an fMRI scanner, which actually is a typical MRI, but it allows us to sort of track blood flow in the brain so we can see which regions of the brain are activated when you're doing something like recalling a memory. Okay? And what we see here when we have people retrieve just the emotional objects, the, the negative emotional objects following sleep, is we get this beautiful activation in the amygdala, right, which we talked about being the emotional center of the brain, so that's not surprising because it helps you remember the emotional. But we also get those regulatory networks coming online in the anterior cingulate and the prefrontal cortex, which remember, that's the region of the brain that's putting a break on the amygdala. And we think this is important because a lot of people see some of this evidence, this emotional memory evidence that I put up, and they're like, well, Jess, like, why on earth would we, why do you think it's a good thing that the sleeping brain selectively remembers the negative? Like, how is that a good finding? Why would we want to remember the negative things? And I always say, well, think about one of the worst things that's ever happened to you, and ask yourself, would you truly want to forget it or not? And really, as painful as it is, your answer should be no, because you need to learn from those experiences. And certainly our ancestors did. So we need to be able to preserve emotional information and then even the negative things that happen to us. But so that we don't develop an anxiety disorder or depression, we also need to be able to regulate the actual sort of emotional res responsivity we have to that memory of that experience. So we, we want to remember it but you want to regulate your emotional response to it. And that's exactly what the sleeping brain is doing here by, by activating both the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex anterior cingulate. And in fact, what we know also is if instead of letting you sleep, we sleep deprive you, now all of a sudden, if we add positive pictures, you only remember the negative and you actually are almost amnesic for the neutral and the positive pictures that we show you. And in addition to that, when you look at the brain, this is the amygdala. If you look at, if you look at how, how activated the amygdala is after a night, just a single night of sleep deprivation compared to 
a well-slept control group, you can see here you have normal amount of activation in the sleep group, but if we've sleep deprived you, your amygdala is lit up like a Christmas tree. It's overactive when you're recalling these negative emotional memories, and that's because you don't have that prefrontal anterior cingulate circuitry putting a break on it, which we think is what makes it so difficult for you to remember anything but the negative. So what I'm hoping, I guess, here at the conclusion of this talk is that you'll agree with me that we've got enough evidence now to strongly suggest, if not prove, that sleep really is important for your cognitive function and for your brain health. It's, it's critical for your ability to form memories, to come up with creative solutions to problems, to not only remember the emotional things that happened to you, but to regulate your emotional responses to them so that you don't develop some of these horrible depressive and anxiety disorders. And what I'm hoping is that you'll take this evidence to heart and try actually to take a little bit better care of your sleep. Because sleep is really the first thing to go, right? Isn't it the first thing we cut out when we get busy? And I wonder, would we do that if we really, as a society, understood that sleep isn't just this inner, inactive state? I mean, you're only going to cut it out. You're only going to cut out your sleep if you really believe that sleep just doesn't do something for you. But what I'm hoping I've convinced you of today is that sleep does an enormous amount for you. There's a lot going on while you're seemingly inert at night. You might be inert, your body might be inert, but your brain is busy processing memories, it's busy processing emotions, and it's busy finding creative solutions to problems. So what I'm going to urge you to do, and I think the best advice for all of us, is to, to I'm not saying you can, that sleep is like some type of learning via osmosis. You've got to, again, you've got to put the hard work in at the forefront. So think, think, calculate, do your homework, but then sleep on it. And let your brain, this elegant organ that has conserved this sleeping behavior across time and species, do what it was designed to do. So with that, I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience and encourage you to get some sleep. So we have about five or six minutes for questions. I'd be happy to answer some. Yes? What happens when, let's say, you get your eight hours of sleep, but you don't get it in one continuous piece? You maybe you get a few at night and then a few the next day napping or something. Yeah. There's actually, so there's, a, there's evidence that as long as you preserve those so-called ultradian cycles, you know, stages one, two, three, four, REM, those 90-minute episodes, that you can actually break up sleep quite, a, sleep quite a bit. So we know, just look at siesta cultures in Spain. Those guys actually sleep for about five or six hours at night, and then they'll take a long nap during the heat of the afternoon. And we also know, um, actually from historical analysis, that, that really, at least in Victorian times, if not before, people actually would have this sort of nightlife where they would sleep sort of half the night. They'd get up, they'd socialize, they'd go to each other's houses, and then they'd go back to sleep for a little while. So there really is quite a bit of evidence suggesting that as long as you preserve those ultradian cycles, you can break up sleep quite a bit. And the cycle is like 90 minutes? 90 minutes about. Yeah. Yep. yep, in the back there. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your lecture. I mean, I find it practically, you find it very helpful. Encouraging me to sleep as I get older, and I want naps, so maybe there's a plus <laughs> about that. Uh, it has to do with your discipline. Um, so much of your work comes from the objective and what goes on in sleep, et cetera, et cetera. There's the other part about the dream mm -hmm. and the meaning and Jung and Freud mm -hmm. and what they did with all that. In universities and maybe even here, are those professors talking to one another? And are, I mean, do you keep your disciplines distinct? Because on another level, I mean, even if you go into the scripture, they talk about all kinds of dreams, et cetera, et cetera. And that seems to be in the meaning of purpose here. I yeah. guess I'll focus it by saying, have you been involved or are universities across the country trying to pull those two things together for you the know, benefit of others? So the, the answer to that is that I am deeply involved in it. I am maybe one of the only cognitive neuroscientists, though, that will admit to an interest in dreaming. Because what's happened sort of, and this all boils down to psychology really wanting to become a bona fide science, which it is. you know. But what, what happened with Freud and other people who had brilliant theories but didn't have a lot of empirical data to back it up, it gave dreaming sort of a bad rap. And so actually to the point where I've been advised over and over again that do not study dreams until you get tenure. <laughs> okay? But mark my words, I am already doing it a little bit and I will do it much more richly once I do have tenure. Um, 
And the other, the other sad thing is that, so no, there's not a lot of crosstalk. There's, not, there's nothing near the crosstalk that really should exist between people who are studying dreams in a clinical sense and then people who are studying sleep in a more sort of psychological cognitive neuroscience sense. And that needs to change. You know, and it's just all about an unfortunate sort of history and misunderstandings and misreadings of Freud even, and, and it's, it's depressing to me. But I'm, I'm at the vanguard. I'm going to change that once I have tenure. <laughs> yeah? Uh, you've convinced me after an hour that sleep is good for Yes! Uh, however, again, can one train oneself or be trained? It's easy to say sleep's good, but I can't get to sleep. Or can I lie down for 20 minutes and get that kind of sleep? That yes, I'm so glad you I've asked you this, I'm so glad you've asked this question because there are many, many, many studies suggesting that you can actually, just like you can learn to sleep poorly, which unfortunately a lot of us do, developing somnia, bad habits, so on and so forth, you can learn to sleep better. I wish I had time to go into it. This could be an entirely separate lecture, but I'm going to urge you to Google something called sleep hygiene, and it's going to give you a list of, of um, things to follow religiously that will help you if you're having trouble falling asleep at night. But the other thing I want to do and would be remiss not to do before leaving this auditorium is to encourage you to nap. If you're having trouble getting the sleep that you need at night, train yourself to be a power napper. A lot of people do it naturally. A lot of people struggle to do it when they first start trying. But it's overwhelmingly clear from the evidence that if you stick to it and you keep trying to nap at roughly the same time every day, you will eventually become a pretty good napper. At least the vast majority of people will. And again, you want to be in that sweet spot of about 20 minutes for the nap, unless you have the luxury of doing 90, which most of us don't. So, but if you train yourself to nap, that will actually dis dispel a lot of your sleep debt. You'll, be, you'll feel a lot better during the day. You'll be a lot more productive and a lot more creative. Because even though I was talking mostly about overnight studies here, we're just now in the lab beginning to look at what happens if we just have people take a brief nap instead. And actually, the data are almost just as impressive. Maybe time for one more. Yes, right here. You answered one of my, my questions I've had for years in your lecture. I always wanted to know, I'm an artist, I always wanted to know why I had these beautiful scenes before me in my sleep. And I said, oh my God, if I could paint that, if I could do this, these little things, all these things appear. And I wake up and I said, it's so beautiful, I could never do it. But that creative part of the art in your sleep. Exactly. Was and that, I mean, I hope that, I hope that. And the other thing I want to mention is that in the same way you can train yourself to sleep and to nap, you can train yourself to remember your dreams just by doing the simple act of forming an intention before you go to bed at night for about two weeks. I would like to remember my dreams. Most of you will start remembering a lot more of them. And it is, I, I honestly, I'm not even a musician and sometimes I compose music at night. Same thing, I am a really verbal and not visual person, but I can, I can, I see beautiful scenes. And, and I should have also mentioned that the other region of the brain that's extremely activated during REM sleep is in the occipital cortex, which is where your visual cortex is. And so this, the, the clarity that you can get is, is actually better than wakefulness in some cases, because basically all of your incoming sort of visual stimulation is cut off, right? You're not looking at anything. What you're doing is you're, you're, seeing, you're seeing what you've already encountered, and you're blending it together in different ways. So yeah, capitalize on this creative state. We must come to a halt. I, we've all got many things we're going to take home from this. My take home is that only in America would a word list to do with doctors include the word lawyer. <laughs> Thank you.